So, this is already the episode 7 for the present value series. And we will be talking about interpolation. So, what is this interpolation? So, interpolation is actually just a method to get the real interest rate or the effective interest rate that the debtor will be paying. So, why is it so important to know how to compute the effective interest rate? Answer, if you know how to compute it, then you'll be able to choose the borrowing option with the least rate of interest. Again, if you're the debtor and you know how to compute the effective interest rate, then you'll be able to choose the borrowing option with the least rate of interest. Because actually, there are a lot of borrowing options out there. And you need to be sure that you will choose the option with the least cost and the least burden. Okay? So, let's learn how to compute the effective interest rate in this video. But before we continue, I am Glets Marbi Igasama and this is Glets Accounting Lectures. So, in order to appreciate the importance of getting the effective interest rate, let's have an example, okay? Example, you wanted to buy a car. And example, this is the car. So, it seems like it's a flying car. But just imagine this is your dream car, okay? And this costs 4 million. And assuming that you don't have any money, you considered some borrowing options. So, the first option is you can borrow a loan with a principal of 4 million. Although, you have to pay aside from the 4 million principal, you have to pay 10% interest per year for 4 years, which is the maturity term. And if you choose this borrowing option, you are guaranteed to receive immediately a proceeds amount of 4 million, which is the amount that you need to purchase this flying car. Now, the computation for effective rate in this option is not that complicated. Why? Because the proceeds is equal to the principal. Therefore, the effective rate is also 10%, which is equivalent to the nominal rate. So in this option, we don't need to interpolate. So we have option 2. And actually, the problem is in this option because... The loan principal that you need to avail in this option is 4,250,000 in order to get a proceeds of 4 million. And remember, you need 4 million to purchase this car, right? But why is that? It's because the provider of the funds needs to charge 250,000 worth of deductions in advance. So, let's not elaborate the specifics of the deductions for this problem because actually it's not really needed to get the effective rate. But, I know you already have an idea of what could be the items here because we talked about that in the past episode, right? So, the maturity period is still 4 years, the same with the first option, but the nominal interest rate for this option is only 7% per annum which makes it more attractive versus the first option because here, 7% out of 4,250,000, it's only 297,500. While here in the first option, you need to pay 10% of 4 million, which is 400,000. Although, here, you only need to pay 4 million principal at the end of 4 years, while in this option 2, you need to pay 4,250,000. So the question is, which of the two options will you select? And for that, we need to compute the effective rate for the second option. Okay? So how do we do that? Again, through interpolation. But before we do that, I need you to realize something. Okay? So based on the previous episode, we made two sample situations, right? So, we made example number one with the following summarized details. So, there is a debtor who applied for a loan. The principal is 3 million and the nominal rate is 10%. The maturity period is 3 years. You remember that, right? So, 
In addition to that sample number 1, the proceeds received by the debtor is also 3 million, which is equivalent to the amount of the principal. And I told you that the effective rate is 10% in that sample, which is equal to the nominal rate. Because, I emphasized, it's always the case if the proceeds is equivalent to the principal, right? And we also have proven that if we use 10% as the rate in getting the present value of the principal and in getting the present value of the interest, the sum of the present values of the principal plus the present value of the interest will actually result to the principal. I hope you still remember. Now, in example number two, everything was the same, except that the proceeds received by the debtor is lesser than the principal, which is to be exact, 2,721,399 only. That is why the effective interest rate is higher than the nominal rate. Because again, the debtor suffers paying an interest of 10%, which is based on 3 million principal and not based on what was actually received by the debtor, which is again, only 2.7 million plus. So, the debtor, aside from that, also suffered from the advance deductions. So, what I want you to realize is that if the debtor receives proceeds which is equal to the principal that he or she has to pay in the future, just like in this example number one, then the effective rate is equivalent to the nominal rate. But, if the proceeds received by the debtor is lower than the principal to be paid, just like in this example number two, then it's clear that the debtor is paying higher interest rate than the nominal or the agreed interest rate. You need to remember that, okay? And lastly, this is very seldom, if the proceeds that's given to the debtor is higher than that of the principal to be paid, it means that the debtor is paying lesser interest rate than the nominal interest rate. Again, this is seldom. It's nearly impossible that the financial institutions release more money as proceeds to the debtor than the agreed principal to be paid. But if we talk about bonds payable, this is actually possible. So again, if the proceeds is equal to the principal, then the effective rate is equivalent to the nominal rate. And if the proceeds are lesser than the principal, then the effective rate is higher than that of the nominal rate. And lastly, if it happens that the proceeds are higher than that of the principal, then the effective rate should be lower than the nominal rate. Or, in other words, the interest rate and the proceeds have an inverse relationship. So meaning, the higher the proceeds, the lower the effective interest rate. And the lower the proceeds, like in this example number two, the higher the effective interest rate. Okay? So that's it. Well, you need to remember this in the interpolation process. Okay? Now, let's start the getting of the effective rate for this borrowing option number two. So step one. So step one is what do we call as the trial and error. So what is this? So, in the past episode, I told you to compute the present value of the principal and it should be separated from the present value of the interest, just like this, okay? So, after that, you need to add the present value of both the interest and the principal and you will get the total present value, which should be equal to the proceeds amount, just like this one. So, now... The trial and error is just like that. So you just need to get the present value of the principal and the present value of the interest. But you are to use the rates based on your judgment. Like for example, in this borrowing option, since the proceeds is very much different from the principal, then it means that the effective rate is not the 7%. Okay? Now, you need to decide on a rate and try computing the present value of both the principal and present value of the interest. And then, you need to add both the present values and hope that it is equivalent to the proceeds of 4 million. 
because actually, the goal of the trial and error is to get two rates in which the present value of the principal plus the present value of the interest computed using those rates should result nearest to the proceeds amount. So actually, there are a lot of rates that can be tried. But how do we narrow it down? Well, this might help. So remember this? Of course you do. In this example, as you can see, the proceeds are lesser than the principal. So this means this rule here applies. So the conclusion is the effective rate must be higher than the 7%. So we have narrowed it down to above 7%. So you don't need to try percentages that are below 7%. Now, let's try using 10%. And let's get the present value of the principal and the interest based on that rate, okay? But that would be on the next episode already to keep this video short. So if you learned, please click like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell and select all to be updated on my next videos. And thank you for watching and see you on the next one.